The peace of the Lord be with you all. I do hope that everyone is learning well in our community Bible experience so far. We are almost coming to the middle of the letter, and each week we have a key word. Last week, the key word was refrain. Now this week, the key word is abide. Or in simple terms, the word abide means to remain in the same place, to stay in the same position over a period of time. Now, the opposite of abide is to take leave, to move away from, and that is the exhortation given here in this part of First John. Now, John draws attention to the fact that the recipients of his letter are now in the last hour. Or here is a term that reminds us, oh, dear Slides, are you with me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Here is a term that reminds us that since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has set in motion to bring the end when Jesus will come as promised and establish his kingdom. All the preparation now focuses on the glorious return of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing more that God must do for the salvation of sinners. And John lived constantly in that expectancy of Jesus' return regarding his time as the last hour. Yeah? Do you share that same expectancy that the Lord's return can come at any time? Yeah, I have church members telling me, uh, Another two years more, Jesus don't come yet, don't come yet. Huh? And most of the reason is because they have been very laxed. They have not wind themselves up, you know, to the point of being ready to receive the Lord at his return. But it's true, we will not be told when that day will be. And John shared his anxiety in this letter that ungodly false teachers that he refers to as antichrist, they had been growing in intensity since the last hour. They had been growing in their activities, or uh, sort of like ramping up those activities. And who are the Antichrist? Now, the term Antichrist is used in the Bible only by this apostle, the Apostle John. And the prefix anti has a dual meaning. It means both against Christ, a spirit in the world that opposes and denies Christ. And there are many false teachers that embody this spirit during John's time. And also there is the other meaning of instead of Christ. People who come up to give you alternatives or, you know, instead of Christ, there is this other powerful person. Or a person in the end that will head up the final rebellion against Christ. There will be such a person who will arise in the last days. Now, the spirit of the Antichrist has been in the world since Satan declared war on God from Genesis chapter 3. And this spirit is behind every false doctrine and every religious substitute for the realities Christians have in Christ. Satan, in his frenzy, uh, is fighting Jesus Christ, fighting the eternal truth, and he is trying to substitute all these realities that Jesus has promised us with counterfeits, you know, things that can, you know, look alike, but it's not really, but it can be the counterfeit that uh, will deceive you, delude you. And the spirit of the Antichrist is active in our world today. Yeah, and like I say, it will eventually lead to the appearance of a specific individual whom the Bible calls Antichrist with a capital A. Now, during these intervening centuries till this present day, Antichrists have increased 
both in numbers and in influence. John is very concerned that the church become alert to what he calls the liars, the deceivers who have gone into the world spreading their deception. We live in this last hour of deception where God in his sovereignty allows deception to spread. Just this month, the Christian Research Network published a damning article that most evangelicals are heretics that hold to damnable beliefs. Or in the survey this year, 2022, Lifeway Research, or as usual, every two years they will do this survey uh, and they were conducted among the evangelicals in the US. Some 3,000 odd people will answer these questions and you can read the survey results, the full set uh, in the Ligonia Ministries State of Theology survey. If you'd like to know more, you can always text me. But the outcome uncovered that the majority of these who would fall under what we call evangelicals held beliefs that were contrary to the historic Christian faith. For example, the first um, question, one of the questions, everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. Apparently, 65% versus 32%, 65% agree versus 32% that disagree. This reveals that the biblical teaching of original sin is not embraced by most evangelicals. God's word, however, makes clear that all humans are by nature children of wrath. This truth is foundational for an accurate understanding of the gospel and of our absolute need for the grace of God in salvation. Let's take a look at another one. Oh, it says, The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but it's not literary, literally true. This is the clearest and the most consistent trend revealed by the State of Theology survey of from 2014. You know, it has gone up year after year. Uh, from 2018, 41%, this year it's crossed the halfway mark, 53%. That means half of them think that, you know, what is in the Bible is not literally true. This view makes it easy for individuals to accept biblical teaching that they can resonate with, while simultaneously rejecting any biblical teaching that is out of step with their personal views or broader cultural values. The Bible, however, is a unified message from the one true God. And as such, it is to be embraced in all its fullness as God's perfect revelation to humankind. And we must conform our lives to Scripture rather than twist Scripture to suit our lives. The third um, survey question, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. True or false? This has grown 30% from 2020 to what it is today. This year's survey also revealed a significant increase in evangelicals who deny Jesus' divinity. Such a belief is contrary to Scripture, which affirms from beginning to the end that Jesus is God indeed. So you'll find that this 2022 State of Theology survey reveals that believers in the West increasingly reject the divine origin and complete accuracy of the Bible. They are also increasingly holding to unbiblical worldviews since there is no enduring plumb line of absolute truth to conform to. And in the evangelical sphere, doctrines including the deity and the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, as well as the inspiration and the authority of the Bible, these are increasingly being rejected. Are you shocked? This is the work of the spirit of the Antichrist in the last hour. 
It is also invading Christianity in Asia. If someone were to do a survey for Singapore, I wonder what our results will reveal. What are your beliefs? How many percent of our beliefs have we allowed to be warped by broader cultural values that swerve around us? Now, these false teachers will earnestly attempt to convert others to their anti-Christian doctrines. Uh, John then goes on to say in verses 24 to 26, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you also will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Abide, stay with what you have heard from the beginning. Oh, Jesus calls Satan uh, um, the father of lies, who is intent on le leading Christians astray by dispensing uh, false doctrines. Sometimes we hear something false, uh, but a bit of us uh, uh, will say, Ayah, since that church so big, no? believe this, there must be some truth lah. And so, on top of what you have learned since the beginning of your life as a believer, you also take a little bit of the, that one uh, that a lot of people believe, uh, that big, big church. Uh, and I also put that little bit of teaching inside my heart. Uh, that is itself not abiding already. Uh, that's what it means. We should not accept uh, Everything a person tells us simply because he claims to believe the Bible. Because it is very possible to twist the Bible to make it mean almost anything. We are almost always attracted to something just because it is new. And particularly when it has a very big following. Yeah? We are almost always attracted to things new. And think that new means better. But when it comes to truth, John tells us, new is not better. Would you say that you are often itching for something new and seemingly more exciting, even if it departs from what you have heard from the beginning? Or don't be fooled. How do I abide in Jesus? Does it mean I just stay put and then do nothing? No. Abiding in Christ, in Jesus, is not a passive state. It is an active thing. And we must give ourselves both mentally and spiritually to living in Christ, walking as Jesus walked. As I was looking you know, for a very nice quote uh, to share with you, I came across this one uh, which touched my heart and I hope it touches you. Uh, this is a, a quote from Andre Murray. Huh? I'm sure he is long gone in heaven. Uh, and he says, Christ Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. In other words, I, the living one, who have so completely given myself to you, am the vine. You cannot trust me too much. I am the almighty worker, full of a divine life and power. You are the branches of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there is in your heart the consciousness that you are not strong, healthy, fruit-bearing branch, not closely linked with Jesus, not living in Him as you should be, then listen to Him. Say to you, I am the vine. I will receive you. I will draw you to myself. I will bless you. I will strengthen you. I will fill you with my spirit. That is abiding in Christ. Like the branch is to the vine. And stay there. Stay connected. Yet, not only are we called to abide in Him, we are also called 
to uh, to allow him to know that he abides in us or Christ abides in us it is a two way relationship and the quote continues, uh, which is this part very touching. He says, I, the vine, have taken you to be my branches. I have given myself utterly to you. Children, give yourselves utterly to me. I have surrendered myself as God absolutely to you. I became man and died for you that I might be entirely yours come and surrender yourselves entirely to be mine God's unchanging love beckons us come and surrender yourselves entirely to be mine to deeper fellowship with him to deeper acts of repentance I cannot stay this way. I need to work on the parts of me that needs turning. Deeper involvement with his community, with his plans for the last hour. Two things account for the ease with which believers are deceived. Oh, there are two things. First is a lack of grounding in the word of God. Secondly, is a lack of Life in the Holy Spirit, that very vital experience of life with the Spirit of God living inside of you. 1 John 2 verse 18 to 27 is written to a situation like ours. And the two things John calls for is a deeper rooting in the Word of God and a deeper experience of of the Spirit of God. The Word of God and the Spirit of God are our only hope for stability in a world filled with anti-Christ. Instead of feeling, you know, um, of course, this lacking of grounding in the Word of God, we are trying to uh, help you. So every year you find, right, we are quite on it, eh? always putting you through the community Bible experience, trying to deepen, widen uh, your exposure to the Bible. But instead of like feeling very insecure huh, during this last hour with all this anti-Christian teaching, anti-Christ teaching everywhere, Joy points us to the people points to the readers to a gift that God has given to prepare us for this hour. This equipment is the anointing that we have received. The anointing that we have received. The word is important to look at more closely because John actually repeated this word three times in the very short passage. Uh, in verse 20 and in verse 27, two times. Uh, the anointing on believers is sufficient, sufficient for the hour. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22, Paul says, And it is God who establishes you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us. How God establishes us in Christ and he has anointed us uh, and put his seal on us and given his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Uh, it's like putting a deposit, no? And he tells you this deposit now means that I intend to give you in full in the future. Or it's a pledge that more will come. Or God is the one who has confirmed and sealed us as his people. And therefore, we believers do not need to seek out other anointings in order to be equipped for the age we live in. So some antichrist were saying, no, of course, knowledge is a gift of the Spirit and we have the Spirit and can tell you some crucial information that you have been missing about Jesus Christ. I've got something that you haven't had knowledge of before and let me induct you 
into this. That is what virtually every sect or cult does. It claims some special revelation beyond the original. And it claims that, you know, uh, don't worry about what you have received from the apostles. I have that hidden interpretation of the Bible. Or I am given an anointing by God, you know, and I have this special insight that the apostles didn't have. So here it is. Let me induct you. You need this anointing. Yeah? Then you will have the same, you have the same type of understanding, deep understanding like me. How does the anointing of the Spirit enable the saints to know the truth and protect them from deception? Now, verse 24 is the key there. Twice in that verse, John stresses that the truth should remain and stay inside with you. It's truth that came to them through their ears. They had heard John speak to them from the very beginning of their Christian walk. He said, what you have heard from the beginning, what you have heard from the beginning, he told them twice that the false teachers were always trying to diminish the importance and the person of Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, how can you keep from coveting this kind of offer? I have something special. And he suggests that, you know, yeah, what they offer will give you more spiritual authority, more strength, or if there's more to be had. Also, John counters this temptation of running after special anointings by reminding the Christians that the anointing that they had already received is from the anointed one himself. The anointing is from Jesus Christ. In verse 27, he openly calls out to the believers to abide, remain, stay in the relationship with the Father and the Son just the way they had begun their Christian journey. And the outcome is to inherit eternal life. And John asserts that the work of the Holy Spirit is to help us accept and abide in that teaching. It helps us to grow in our understanding of that teaching, that first teaching that had come to us from the responsible, God-fearing teachers. It strengthens our power to practice of that teaching. It increases our confidence that what we have believed is the truth. And therefore, we must let the Word of God abide in us, and we should abide in the Spirit. Now, in chapter 3, John addresses uh, what happened uh, when a false teaching is being uh, attested in their community. He addressed this false teaching that was threatening to destroy the assurance of believers who have been lovingly received and adopted by God. Now, what were these false teachings, these false teachers talking about? They were saying that the pre existent Son of God, Jesus Christ, had not come in the flesh. They did not believe in the full union of the pre existent Son of God with the fleshly human nature like ours. I want to just bring you ahead to chapter 4, huh? just one verse. Or oh, you will have someone preach on chapter 4 again. Uh, a few weeks down the road. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It is evident that the false teachers did not like this idea that the pre-existent Christ was, is united, or it was being united with his human flesh why? Because they wanted to de-link being a Christian from the moral demands in practical living. Yeah, one of the clearest places to see this is here in verses 7 and 8 
uh, chapter 3. Uh, little children, let no one deceive you. So he has the false teachers in view down here. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The deceivers were trying to tell them, you can be righteous in your spirit and yet not practice righteousness. You know, it's all about your soul and your spirit. Yeah? So the body, don't worry about it. It will be destroyed, you know? And what the body does is not what is the important part. The important part that will be saved is your soul and your spirit. So, you know, it's disconnected one, no? So don't worry about sinning. Don't have to live righteous life. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah? And John says the only people who are righteous are the ones who practice righteousness. Doing confirms who and what you are and how you are in Christ. Being, doing confirms your being. You are in Christ. John threw additional light on why this teaching is false in verses 5 and 8b. He says, you know that he appeared in order to do what? Jesus appeared in order to do, do what? In verse 5, to take away sins and in him there is no sin. The reason that the Son of God appeared now in verse 8b was to destroy the work of the devil. The purpose that the Son of God was revealed in this world was so that he might destroy the works of the devil once and for all. Know that he did not come to neutralize the devil. He did not come to lessen the work of the devil. He did not come to limit them. No, Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil, to dissolve it, to melt it, to ensure that it no longer exists. Yeah, that is the meaning of the word destroy, break up. Yeah, this morning as you are listening to me, you know, I don't know how you feel. Maybe you think I'm not having the spirit of Christ wanting to destroy the works of the devil. I still allow the works of the devil to propagate inside my heart in the secret place or where I am. I still indulge in sin. And this morning is true when you are listening to me. I don't know how many of you feel quite crushed that your struggle against sinning is still very tough going. I'd like to bring to your attention a verse outside of 1 John. It's from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. And it says, Consider Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Every time I look at myself and the efforts I put in putting away sin, I always find that I haven't resisted no, very much. Not to mention no, to the point of shedding your blood. But consider Jesus. He struggled to the point of shedding his blood in order to overcome the devil. He did it completely by his life, his suffering, his death and his resurrection. He gave up his life in that struggle against the temptation not to, not to finish the work entrusted to him by God to save the world, to save the world that God loves. He's struggling with that temptation right up to the very last moment. But you see, he resisted. And he overcame. I like to challenge you. Consider Christ as your example. I want to end my sharing with this encouragement from verse 9 in chapter 3. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. 
This spiritual birthing work has been completed in the past. Now, how Christ birthed you, birthed you into the family of God. It was completed in the past once and for all, and it does not need to be repeated. In addition, the effects of being birthed are fully and totally completed and accomplished. It cannot be reversed by anybody else. So have confidence that this great atonement for sin for you has been completely done, completed in the past by Jesus with absolutely nothing from our participation. John gives us encouragement not to despair, for the new birth will inevitably turn the habits of sin upside down. If you stay close to the prompting of the Holy Spirit that has been given to you, or because this, when we are born again, John says God's seed abides in us forever and we cannot keep on sinning. Something has been sown in us. The seed, oh, uh, the original word no, is actually the word for sperm, you know. It's been planted in you and it's going to abide always, always. And this potential new life from God is going to grow, unstoppable. It will sprout and it will bear the likeness of Christ. It will continue to do so, and no one can snatch away the seed and its life-renewing powers. God himself is at work in the new birth, in your new birth, so powerfully that we cannot keep on practicing sin. And God's seed will come alive in you and break up the patterns of sinful behaviour. This is our hope. The anointing of God is upon us. His seed is hidden in us and is always calling out to you, calling out to you, will you surrender to me? Will you resist to the point of shedding your blood? Will you come and surrender yourselves entirely to be mine. Shall we pray? Lord God, when we think of the great and immense love that you have for us, our hearts simply are overwhelmed because you did not want us to stay and live in sin. God, you have given us all the resources that we may live the life that you have given. Come and continue your work in us, that we will see ourselves desiring so much to be absolutely surrendered to you. We pray and ask Lord, for those of us who are assailed by false teachings, wanting to, to share the joy of someone in a group that is big and large, but perpetuating falsehood. And we want to keep a bit of that teaching in our hearts. Help us to know that these are the things that we need to throw away without hesitation, because it does not come from you however many people are attracted. We pray that God, you give us the spirit of wisdom to stay with you, remain in your teachings, and know that this is the way to go in the generation that lives in the last, last hour of our times. So help us, God, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.